Hello, Product Con. Woohoo! So, anyone here recognizes who said these words? Uh, yeah. So, Elon Musk crashed the South by Southwest when, and when they asked about what he's afraid of, he had this to say about AI. I think there's a whole range of spectrum of uh, views on the singularity of AI, which is essentially going from bring my AI butler all the way to, oh my God, please wait, and may his soul rest in peace, Stephen Hawking, who I really adore, um, kind of says AI is another story, not yet, right? Um, so I think there's a whole range, and for right reasons, hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll be having the information to, to know where you stand in this spectrum of tech singularity. So I'm Aarti Srinivasan. I, I head up the uh, personalization product at Target. I have a background in engineering and uh, MBA. And I enjoy learning about new technologies and using that for uh, solving real customer problems. That's what I do. Today, what we would discuss is the types of AI which is out there. It's a very high-level talk. It doesn't get into the technology because there are other talks which I've given here which talks about the technology. This is more um, making you or allowing you to enter a little bit into the geekdom so you can have an informed um, decision with your data scientists and developers. And in the end, I'll also provide an intersection of uh, AI and blockchain. So it's my view, and I'm supposed to say this legally. It's not the view of Target. It's my view. And uh, so hopefully that will help you as well. So AI is not new. Why, are we, why is everybody talking about it now, right? There's three things to this puzzle. One is compute power. Andrew Eng started using graphic processing units to process the transactions or process algorithms and data sets in AI. And that kind of sped up things, right? And people started investing in hardware as well. The second thing is algorithms and uh, the ease with which you can mine the data and have these structured training data. So that's the second thing. And third, I mean, we rely so much on technology. We have like Google. In fact, uh, Scott Galloway gave a talk and said, Google is man's god because it gets one in every six questions as a new question. We don't ask our grandparents or priests or other people, but we go and ask Google all these new questions and trust so much in that. No wonder they have the power of, um, you know, the GDP of India when you combine all these um, four big giants together, right? So they are investing in AI platforms, so it's, it is here to stay. So this, these are the three reasons why we are... Um, now everybody is looking at AI. So we'll talk about the types of AI and what is there in each of, each of it. I mean, sure, this audience, this is not new information. AI is the capability of a machine to imitate human behavior. Cognitive ability and to do the right thing, to know right from wrong, is going to take a lot of time. But at least it can imitate and automate something which we can do in less than a second easily. Machine learning is a branch of AI and computer science where the uh, computer will learn to recognize something without being explicitly programmed. The term was coined by Arthur Samuel in 1959 when he created the first checkers game, which was the first self-learning game. And deep learning is another branch of machine learning or, or uh, in AI where you're giving a lot of data sets and you're not Actually, you don't need to label them. So the computer will automatically know how to analyze the data or at least start recognizing the data patterns. And deep learning is catching up a lot as well these days. In terms of machine learning, there are three broad buckets of machine learning. There's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So supervised learning is when you're training the computer, but not necessarily teaching it how, programming it what to do, but giving it data, training data. You're saying, if there are three, house, three rooms in a house, the price is so much in Sunnywell. If there's four rooms in a house, the price is so much in Sunnywell. So you're giving it a training set and giving it an end result, like a key value pair, 
So when you give a new data to it, it knows what's, what to do and how to predict that. That's kind of what uh, supervised learning is. The unsupervised, you're not giving anything to the computer. You're just throwing the data at it, and you're not teaching it, or you're not giving it sample training set. It's automatically um, running an algorithm on it, on it and grouping the data together. So for example, it, it knows to segment your customers by certain characteristics. It knows to collect your news together by certain characteristics. Those are all unsupervised learning. And reinforcement learning is um, when you're rewarding the, the algorithm by saying, OK, this particular outcome was good, so do more of that outcome. When it's trying three or four things and one particular outcome is more successful, you want it to try more of that. And that is, um, that is reinforcement learning. I wish I could do that with my kid all the time. I feel like throwing things at her when she doesn't listen to me. Um, now, deep learning is um, another. There's two big buckets here. There is con convolutional neural network, CNN, and recurrent neural network, RNN. So the difference between them is in the CNN world, you're just extracting information. So you're giving all the inputs to the algorithm. You're extracting the information and using that directly um, without, without any storage for the next set of layers. It's usually, usually used in image recognition, where um, you have like an MRI scan or something, and you're peeling each layer of that to recognize the data. And in terms of recurrent neural networks, it needs a sequence. So it still is doing recognizing, but it needs to have some kind of time sequence. So for example, if I say dog, it needs to understand that it's, it's a dog is an animal. And if I say hot dog, it shouldn't say that the dog is hot, right? It needs to understand it's a type of food. So there's a sequence of information and needs to have internal um, memory or internal um, some kind of nodes to store the information based on what it is derived. It doesn't directly pass the output to the other one. I won't get too much into it, but essentially, these slides will help you if you're working with data science. I mean, the thing which is so exciting about data science and uh, personalization is it's getting academic research. Like, these are all papers, K-mean, Gaussian, all these have multiple papers. And so when you take those papers and apply it to guess problems, that's what we do as product managers. And that's really exciting. So if you understand some kind of types of algorithms and types of papers which can be used for different use cases, that will be a great conversation with your data scientists. So in terms of uh, unsupervised learning, you have descriptive, which is not much machine learning. It's just more saying, these people with age over 40 like my product, and they purchased it. It's, it's just, it's just sequen, um, querying your data and understanding patterns from it, nothing to do with machine learning there. But predictive and prescriptive is clearly looking at your data and, and doing something to predict or prescribe to the users. And these are sample algorithms um, which have been used to solve problems, the use cases which I've written here. This is an eyesore, because you're going to have these slides later. I'm just going to leave it. But essentially know that in terms of supervised learning, you have all the way from linear reg regression, where you're just fitting a line. It's a very simple problem. Like, what's the price of a diamond based on its cut clarity and um, I don't even know what the other uh, cut clarity and weight, maybe. And then you look at all the way to complex um, algorithms like gradient boosting trees or uh, gradient descent algorithms for recommending items to your uh, clients who come to purchase something online. So these are all predictive um, algorithms. In terms of reinforcement learning, um, an example of this would be multi-arm bandit is one of the common papers which people use. It's kind of telling do three things with equal weight, like play three slot machines in equal weight. And the one which wins, whatever action you've done which caused it to win, reward that more and do more of that. So you're reinforcing that. And there are papers in this as well. But that's kind of where you assume all actions are equal. And then you reward the ones which get you more towards conversion or click through or whatever your, uh, your ultimate success goal is. 
types of deep learning, we talked about it. There's convolutional neural network, CNN, which is used for image recognition, MRI scanning. And most of the papers are about, there's in fact a paper about differentiating between a dog face and a muffin top. And I'm like, OK, yeah, <laughs> that's uh, not much use right now. But those are the, it's in the early stages where you can take that and start using it in real problems. But it surely be used in MRI scans or X-ray scans in the future. Um, aerial image surveillance to understand where things are broken and so on. Uh, RNN is used in chatbots where you want to interact with people, you want translation of stuff. There's a time series of data involved, like hot dog versus dog, which is hot. Um, and then narrative for reports, like you have certain um, reports and you want to create a narrative around that, those type of things which you can, um, and the company Narrative Sciences does that. Captions for your, um, for your you know, different language programs are all possible with the RNNs. So I think like we kind of got a view quickly on what is the types of AI. Let's get into blockchain and then see how these two merge. So anyone knows, oh, actually, you know who this is right now. So uh, this is Frank Abagnale, and he was the one depicted by Leonardo DiCaprio in Catch Me If You Can. How many of you have seen that movie? OK, yeah. So he's a Czech fraud imposter, and that's what he is. Imagine if he wants to transact with Pinocchio, who's going to lie a lot. And then six months later, you want somebody to validate this transaction happened. And you want to do it all digitally, and it has to be in the cloud, then that's where blockchain is powerful. Some random people in the world who've never met each other, who don't trust each other, want to transact digitally. And you want a record of the transaction, and you want to make sure that this happened. That's when uh, the power of blockchain comes. Because you're not trusting any third party intermediaries. You're not trusting uh, banks or anyone else. But you're essentially assuming that this technology will help you transact with anybody in the world. So blockchain is a growing uh, list of digital records. It usually has a link to the previous record. It has a timestamp and data in some form, either the raw data or a representation of that data. Originally, it initiated by this Genesis block or the first block by the Bitcoin paper, which was created by Satoshi. We still don't know whether it's a man, woman, where he is. And um, this was what was in the first block. It talks about the 2008 crash, financial crash. And so he clearly was disappointed with the financial systems, and he wanted to, he or she wanted to eliminate the intermediate, intermediaries and create a decentralized system so anybody in the world can transact and have a level playing field for mining. That's how it was originally created. So this is an example Bitcoin block. There are other different types of block platforms. Um, so it might slightly, what's, what goes in the verified block might be slightly different de depending on which platform it is. Like Hyperledger may have something different. Corda may have something different in its block. Ethereum may have something slightly different in its block. But in general, it has a timestamp. Um, it has a nonce. And nonce is nothing but a random number which miners will continue incrementing till they solve the puzzle for that particular block. They need to find a hash for the block. And they've given a certain condition to find the hash for the block. And they keep incrementing that, just pure brute force incrementing in that. And that's how they find the verification of that block. The block has a bunch of transactions. Each Bitcoin block is about 1 MB. And so it'll have like 10 or 15 transactions, depending on um, how much you can do there. And it has a reference to the previous hash. So this is how like every time you mine and verify a block, then the new block generate is generated. And again, this mining happens only in Bitcoin or Ethereum or those kind of crypto blockchains. But if you think about Hyperledger or some other permission, and we'll get into that in the next slides, those things don't have this concept of mining. It has a concept of consensus. This is an um, this is the original first block. I just put it there so that you can see the first code. OK, so the types of blockchain, there are two types of, broadly two types of blockchains. The permissionless blockchain, which is anybody, you and I can participate. It's the Bitcoin, Ethereum. Anyone in the world can participate in that blockchain. 
the permission blockchain is also has a lot of the characteristics of the permissionless blockchain but it has certain rules and actors in the in the system who can participate in that blockchain so the purpose is still the same to increase trust to increase transparency to have a general ledger but how do you verify that block is very different in each of these cases so in permission usually you use consensus based so you'll say three out of four people have to agree and these are the four people who were appointed to agree this particular uh, or approve this particular block again an iso chart but like essentially there is four common blockchain platforms i put here and there's more added on um, unless we have standardization it's going to be difficult to keep up because there's uh, so many new blockchains platforms which are added so if you think about the bitcoin ethereum the permissionless the verification is usually the proof of work which is where mining comes in mining is essentially finding that hash code in that block the more compute power you have the better asic chips you have you're going to find that hash much faster whereas the other two permissioned ones they don't have that concept they are more consensus based or it's used for business purposes where you have certain appointed roles as notaries as approvers as validators as participators and so on right it's not necessarily everybody has to mine um and and then in terms of the permission states we already talked about it there is bitcoin doesn't have that many smart contracts it has a basic form of a smart contract and smart contract is a code which gets executed automatically when it um, when some event happens that's the simplest way to explain it and then in ethereum it has smart contracts whereas in um, hyperledger they do have smart contracts and the languages which you use are all different right So I think like it's it's kind of you asking uh, developers which one is your preferred platform to work with in terms of permissioned and permissionless. So that's kind of how it's evolving right now unless we have standardization. Um uh, everything is distributed in the permissionless place so you and I can participate equally in that. In the permissioned you might have access to the um you might have a copy of the ledger but you can participate in it unless your role is specified as somebody who's approving or somebody who is um, notarizing the transaction and um, in the r3 corda which is specific for financial applications there they've even saying the data is not available to everybody but it's only available to certain group of users um, but it will be multiple copies will be made so like three people will have this copy or five people will have that copy and when you put them all together you know how to create all the data in the block so not everybody needs to maintain a copy of every single block so in terms of who can create a block uh, anybody in bitcoin and ethereum can create a block and can be a contract account in ethereum or an external account a contract account is one which can have these smart smart contracts or execute these smart contracts and then in the other ones we have these roles like validator or transactor and valid notary as well cryptocurrency should should a blockchain always have cryptocurrency not necessarily in the permission less case yes you're mining and you're uh, earning bitcoins or ethereum whereas in hyperledger or in uh, corda it's just like another platform for online okay so i'm going to quickly run through these slides so in terms of where we are with ai and blockchain we are about 25% of the innovation phase right so if you think about ai it's in parallelly innovating in as blockchain is also parallelly innovating in ai you have concepts where um training data is important lot of investments around that area uh, self driving car is important lot of investments in that area finance healthcare those are all areas which are being heavily invested in and in terms of big companies and corporations what's happening is um what's happening is we have the platform investments we have vision and voice investments because voice will be the new text if you see how like the younger generation is interacting with their phones and ipads nobody is sitting and typing a search they're all talking with the device right and so that's kind of so true that's where they're investing so in terms of the blockchain future so first how many of you here have a wallet okay 
So I think like we, we have to get to a stage state where it's so easy that everybody is confident about having a wallet and has a wallet, right? So step one is to have that um, identity platform, make it easy to onboard and have standardization across these uh, permissionless platforms as well. So in terms of um, last month or the two months ago when I gave the talk, I predicted that there will be every, um, every app which is there on your phone will have an equivalent app in blockchain. And that's kind of happening now, like social uh, networks, search in the blockchain, um, maybe Airbnb will happen in the blockchain. So everything what you have in our, in our existing world without these decentralized systems um, are going to have a, have a twin in the blockchain world, right? And once that happens, you're now crowdsourcing data. You have that in the blockchain. You add the power of AI to that. So for example, um, let's assume that you have certain medical contracts that you're storing in the blockchain. Your doctor walks into the office. Tuberculosis is a very common thing in India, but it's so uncommon here. So, and many times it's misdiagnosed here because people don't have exposure to that, right? Whereas if you have this central decentralized system with all the data sources, your doctor still exists as a human, can see a list of recommendations saying, these are the potential you know, symptoms for this means could be one of these. Do you, have you checked everything? Or your nurse who's going through a checklist in the hospital will now have to do the same checklist, but it's stored in the blockchain. So later when you have an issue with that, you can always um, refer back to you know, what happened in the system. So the, the, the part where Elon Musk freaks out about is you're making a machine. When you have AI in the blockchain, it can execute smart contracts without anybody in the system, right? If you're only um, helping people and you're creating programs which only help people so that it automatically executes and you get rewarded for that, that's great. But if you're a hacker and you want to hack into people's computers and you put a code which is in the blockchain, which when certain smart uh, transactions happen that these contracts execute, then what you're doing is you are having the bad people as well in the network, right? So that's where the fear comes. Or if you have driverless cars and it can make decisions on its own, when to go to your school, when to go to the mechanic's office. So, th I mean, those kind of decisions, when, how much do you want to own and how much do you want the AI to own, right? So those kind of things is where um, the point of contention is. So these are a couple of... Um, I think interesting startups uh, in this token space where Singularity Net got sold out in like, I don't know, half an hour. It's the AI, open AI platform, um, and all the AI algorithms are in the blockchain, accessible to each other data scientist so they can build off of that. FX.AI is um, like, it's mechanical Turk in the first phase. The next phase is an AI marketplace, and then the third phase is compute share. So I just want to end by saying, uh, I in the spectrum of where we are, we will have technology singularity. We will have artificial super intelligence, but we need to do it with ethics, right? And um, even Google's deep brain has built an ethics committee because it can go somewhere and do something wrong. And so we need to have, as humans, we need to have that kind of discipline. So um, you have to figure out, based on all the discussion we had now, where you stand in this spectrum and whether you're all for it or on the other side, not yet. Thank you. <laughs>